Okay, I have a slide presentation. Okay, thank you. Monseigneur to have Queen Sylvia and uh, Monsignor Rotondo and Sorondo, sorry, and all uh, this, uh, this audience uh, here. I think it's a great opportunity to bring a message to the outside world. Uh, there's all kind of expertise in the room. I think I'm simply gonna bring the expertise of a biologist that is uh, a neuroscientist that is fascinated by brain function and what I will try to do is give you a little view of uh, what's happening in the brain under drugs. Of course, drugs are damaging to the brain, and I'll tell you a little bit more. And I'd rather use uh, images rather than words, if this, one, if this is gonna work. Doesn't work. Yeah, it does work. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, just thinking that Pope Francis will come in the room within an hour makes me very nervous. <laughs> um, so this is a brief outline of this presentation. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about the brain. I want to then go and focus on the opioid system. And uh, so this has to do with opiates and what they system they target in the brain. Uh, I will try and give you very recent data uh, on the question which has to do with the opioid prescribed opioid epidemics, which is can we kill pain without addiction? I will then move to uh, one of these opioid receptors and uh, its uh, role in reward systems, then move to other opioid receptors and talk a little bit about comorbidities. Finally, I will generalize to other drugs and uh, tell you a little bit about what happens in brain circuits. So it's a journey across the brain, I would say. Uh, I look, I'd like to set the scene first in the area of mental disorders. Mental disorders, including substance use disorders, are devastating, as you know, for the individual, their family, and society. And uh, I think it's only fairly recent that one understands that behavioral dysfunction is a brain disease. And this has uh, created a paradigm shift, but I think now the public understands that something wrong is happening in the brain. Uh, what is the brain? Well, the brain is our most sophisticated organ. You know, there's all kinds of representation you can find everywhere, you know. Whoops, sorry, that's going now too fast. Uh, brain imaging, and you, you had some images earlier, uh, show you that inside the brain we have this incredibly complex wiring, these fibers that are wired all throughout the brain, and if we zoom in the brain, we're going to see that these wires or fibers are actually parts of cells that are uh, forming the brain. So these cells are called neurons, and they have these extensions that are called axons that you see throughout the brain and form these fibers or circuits. Now, um, we know since a very long time, and uh, Cajal in 1888 created the first, well, or invented the first staining that shows you that actually each neuron in the brain is connected to about 10,000 other neurons. So if we have millions of neurons, 
we also have billions of connections within the brain. So this is to give you a, an idea of the complexity of the organ. And uh, if uh, two decades ago the challenge for biologists was to decipher the human genome, which occurred and actually has revolutionized biology, now the next challenge for biologists in the next two decades will be to understand what we call the connectome. That is, how do all these neurons connect together to create networks that ultimately will control or underlie our behaviors. Now let's still zoom in a little bit. And this is my little cartoon of a neuron. Uh, neuron actually don't touch each other. Uh, neuron talks together through chemical messages. So basically the neuron will receive information from these thousands of dendrite or receptive field, this message will be conveyed by an electric signal and at the very end of the neuron there will be a chemical message that is going to be released and this chemical message we talk to the next neuron and tell the next neuron please go ahead or don't go ahead. It's very simplistic but uh, what is important here and in the area of drug abuse is that the way this chemical message is going to talk to the next neuron is that, so I call this message a neurotransmitter, is that this molecule will basically recognize a protein on the, on the uh, uh, target neuron and will basically bind to this, to a pocket where uh, the shape is almost identical, this neurotransmitter will bind to the pocket and then activate this receptor and this will now have consequences within the next neuron. Now, why is this important? Because drugs, basically what drugs do is they actually by chance or not by chance, they have the same shape of this neurotransmitter and therefore they will hijack the natural neurotransmitter and they will bind in this pocket in place of the neurotransmitter. The big difference is that a, a natural neurotransmitter will be very transient and will activate the receptor in a very transient and localized manner, I would say in a mild manner, whereas the drug will invade the entire brain and will activate very drastically this receptor. So the, the pharmacological effect of a drug on a receptor is much more drastic than the pharmacological effect of the natural transmitter. So this is, makes a big, big difference. Now, uh, I'd like to say that understanding behavior is a challenge. Why is it a challenge? Because in fact, we need to work on, at three levels. We need to understand how these neuron produces, well, how genes encode proteins that form these cells and then how do these cells called neuron organized in networks and talk together and how the synchronized activity of neuronal assemblies in the end will produce outcomes that will lead us to feel, to think, to sense, to, and ultimately to act. Um, in humans, the, the research is pretty difficult because there's no invasive way to tackle the human brain and behavior. So basically, we, in human research, we correlate genomic uh, analysis with basically MRI-type imaging and psychiatric assessment of the individual. This is correlative research. We try to correlate what happens at different levels. But animal research, although highly reductionist, is extremely powerful because we can, in animals like mice, for example, you can customize the genome. You can modify specific bases within the genome, so modify the gene activity, and then you can look at the consequences of this genetic inactivation on neural network activity and on behavior. So you're doing what is called mechanistic research, and now you can find the cause, how does a neuron, how does a gene, a protein, or a neuron actually control behavior? What does it do? And just to give you an example, well, uh, mice have a genome that is 85% identical to the human genome. We can study their behavior. Their brain is very small, 
this is a human brain and on scale this is a mouse brain. So it looks ridiculous, but in fact, we now have imaging techniques that allow to look at brain fibers, for example, in a res using a resolution that is comparable to what we can do in humans. So the rodent models are extremely useful and important, so I wanted to make this point. Now, let me focus on the opioid system. So we heard a lot about recreational opioid use, and you know that opioid, opium actually is used since thousands of years both to relieve pain, but to relieve, in a way, any kind of pain, physical pain, mental pain, social pain. So it has been a challenge uh, for scientists to understand how does opium work? What are the molecules and circuits that are modified under opium? So I will make you a very, I will tell you a very brief history how we went from the plant to the discovery of opioid receptors that are the key actors in this system. And then I will tell you a little bit about free receptors and free function. Well, we know that uh, this morphine, which was discovered or isolated in 1805, produces both analgesia, it is the most potent painkiller, but it also produces euphoria, which eventually may lead to addiction. So this molecule acts on the brain. And just, and you heard about this before, but chemistry and chemical synthesis started two centuries ago when uh, Bayer, the company Bayer, made this simple deacetylation reaction, a very simple chemical reaction, to produce what they call the first non-addictive opiate. And they marketed heroin as the first non-addictive opiate. Very simple chemistry, and this is why this was now doable anywhere, and this is how the opiate problem started. Now, what happens there? So now, let's talk about what we call modern pharmacology. So in 1973, Three teams around the world at the same time demonstrated that a radio label opiate is able to bind on brain membranes. So you can take a brain, you can crush it, make membrane preparation, and then you will see that this radio label opiate will bind to this preparation in a saturable manner. So the idea of a receptor, it was a concept at that time, uh, emerge. So there must be in our brain something where the drug will basically specifically interact and bind. That was the first step, the binding site. So from there, the idea was that we were not born you know, to live in a poppy field. Why would our brain have a specific site that would interact or where the drug would interact? And then came the idea of endogenous neurotransmission. There should be in the brain a natural molecule which looks like morphine, but which is naturally secreted by our neurons and normally acts with these receptors. And this is how two years later, uh, Hughes and Kosterlitz isolated the first natural opioid, we call them peptides. You heard the name, this is metankephalin or luenkephalin. These little peptides, very little proteins, actually are released by our neurons and normally activate these receptors. So there's a natural system that is called the opioid system that operates in our brain. And uh, the use of pharmacology in the next 20 years uh, in animal research demonstrated that this system, so the receptors and the peptides, act together in the brain to reduce pain, to produce euphoria or dysphoria, I'll come to this in a minute, to help responses to stress and is also important to regulate emotional states and has other functions like inhibition of gastrointestinal transit or it regulates respiratory depression. So all in all, the idea emerged that this system was a natural system in our brain that would teach us what is beneficial for our survival and help us cope with stress. So now we have, whoops, sorry. We have the drug. Oh, no, I'm not good at that. Mm. Okay. So now we have the drug. Uh, 
we have the notion of a receptor and the notion of a natural neurotransmitter. So what are the molecules exactly? Now let's go down to molecular level. And to do so, we need to interrogate the genes that encode this constituent of the opioid system. So genes encoding the opioid peptides were isolated in early 80s. There's three genes. They encode for a multi, uh, let's say, purpose protein, which is then cleaved in small peptides. And you heard them. You heard about enkephalins. There's also beta-endorphin. There's dynorphin. This is a whole family of about 20 peptides that naturally are secreted by the neurons and will interact with receptors. Now, what about the receptors? So the receptors, it took about 20 years to isolate from the notion of a receptor. It took 20 years to isolate a gene encoding the receptors. Three genes were found, and these three genes encode three proteins that are called mu opioid, delta opioid, and kappa opioid receptors. So there's three proteins that are very similar and that actually form the binding site that responds to the opioid, either exogenous or endogenous opioid. It took another 20 years, actually, so from 92 to 2012, and this is very recent, to, for scientists to produce artificially enough of these proteins, which are very rare in the brain and very unstable, to produce enough of them to be able to crystallize them and then study their atomic structure using X-ray crystallography. And now we know, and you have images, we know what that we, these objects look like atom by atom. And we know that they have seven transmembrane spanning domain and form a little nest that floats on the surface of the neuron to basically react to the external stimulus that will be either the drug, the opioid drug, or the encephaline or opioid peptide. These three receptors, or three proteins, which are sitting on the surface of our neuron, normally interact with three types of peptides. And this is forming, actually, a complex system. So you have receptors distributing on brain circuits, and you have peptide release at different places of the brain. So this is a complex system. So this is how we classically uh, schematize the receptor, this is what it looks like. What happens when the receptor is activated? The drug comes in from the outside, and then this will trigger a modification in the shape of the receptor, and this receptor will now recruit inside the cell what we call G proteins or other effectors, uh, a number of actors in the cell that would modify the cell physiology. So I represented here two or three of them. We know there are almost 50 of them. And what will happen next is that basically these molecules will inhibit the neuron why way or another. I won't go into details, but what will happen is that this active receptor will talk to channels and this will inhibit electrical conductions around the neuron. So an opioid acting on a receptor will quiet or sil Oops, silence the neuron. And also what we need to know is that this uh, receptor activation will also trigger a number of molecular events that ultimately will reach the genome and modify gene expression. So there's long-term effect of a receptor activation. Now, another thing I need to say here where am I here? Oh, this is the uh, structure of the active myopoid receptor, which was just solved last year. So just to tell you that there's a lot of progress on that field. Now, what is this? When the ligand or the drug activates the receptors, not only is the uh, receptor signaling inside the cell, but also we see, I don't know if we can start this again, what we see is that the receptor, which is outside originally, under the drug effect, will internalize. So this actually is a, an animal that we have engineered, a little mouse, so that the mouse produces a fluorescent receptor. 
so the receptor is active and is visible. And now for the first time, we can see that when the drug is acting, not only does it inhibit the neuron, but also the receptor is basically internalized in the cell. What is the consequence? Well, we can see later on that this receptor is committed towards degradation. So the cell has responded to the stimulation by basically uh, degrading the receptor. And this is a homeostatic response of the cell. The, re the receptor is activated, the cell has to stop the signal and stop the receptor from signaling. So the re receptor disappears from the surface. Now there's no more receptor. If the drug comes, there's no response. This is one uh, mechanism that contributes to what we call tolerance. This may explain why in some cases you need to increase the drug amounts to get a response because the cell is used to it, ablates the receptor from the surface, and then there's no more drug response. Okay, so that's one mechanism for tolerance. Now, let's look at what this receptor does at behavior level. And uh, we know, well, that the free receptors are distributed very differently on the brain. So this is a way to see the kappa, the mu, or the delta receptors in the brain using a pretty old technique, which is a radio label ligand just put on brain slices and you see where the receptor is distributed. But now we have much better way to see exactly where the receptor is expressed. And, we, and using these animals that actually produce fluorescent receptor, we can see the distribution, we can see cells that express the receptor in a brain that we have made transparent, so we can clearly see the cells, so where the receptor is expressed. And then here, we can see that when the receptor has seen the drug, it has been internalized. It's inside the cell in little vesicles. So we have now a precise view of receptor within brain circuits. And we can also now, as I told you, customize the genome, delete this gene. We just take it off, the genome. So we create animals that have no more receptor. And we can look at the consequences of the receptor ablation on neuronal connectivity. And just as an example, this is a mouse that has lost the receptor. We took it off. And we can see how each of 100 brain regions talk to the next 99 brain regions throughout the brain in a live animal. So we can see a fingerprint of the gene activity on the whole brain functionality. Now, let's go to behavior, because this is what we're interested. If we delete this receptor from an animal, what we're going to see is that morphine analgesia, so the anti-pain effect of morphine, is, which you can see here in a normal animal, is totally disappeared. Morphine is inefficient. It doesn't produce analgesia. And we can find this. Uh, also for any other drug that is used clinically. Now what was interesting, and this is an experiment we did with Rafael Maldonado now 20 years ago, right, Rafael? If you delete the receptor from the animal, what you're gonna see is that every morphine effect has disappeared. It could be the therapeutic effect, so morphine analgesia. Morphine doesn't kill pain anymore, but morphine does not produce euphoria anymore and there's no morphine dependence anymore, and there's no morphine-induced constipation anymore, and there's no morphine-induced respiratory depression anymore. So in a way, we delete all the effects of morphine. So this means that a single molecule, a single gene encoding a single molecule, is actually the sole responsible, is the key trigger for every morphine effect. So what does this mean? Well, it may mean that you can develop any opioid as you want, morphine-like compound, you will never separate the uh, painkiller effect from the euphoric effect. So that's what people thought until very recently. And actually creating the ideal analgesic that would be as potent as morphine without any addictive liability, 
is in a way seemed impossible, but this has been the holy grail, if I may say, in the field since ever. And this is linked, of course, to the opioid epidemics, uh, prescribed opioid epidemics. You know, what if we could, in a way, create a painkiller that would be as potent, but would be totally devoid of abuse liability? And there's hope. There's hope, why is that? Because what I showed you earlier, you know, the receptor binding to the, uh, the, the drug, binding to the receptor, and then uh, saying, you know, ask, uh, uh, triggering, you know, neuronal firing or not, this is not exactly true. The reality is much more sophisticated, and it appeared that, in fact, these receptors are highly dynamic molecules, and they can actually uh, activate effectors, different effectors in the cells. And depending on the drug you're going to use, uh, depending on the drug you're going to use, you know, morphine or a morphine-like compound number two or a morphine-like compound number three, acting on this particular receptor, well, you will recruit different effectors and you may lead to a cellular response and to be a behavioral response that will now differ depending on the drug. So you may use drug one that will produce very low efficacy to kill pain, but maybe drug two will activate another effector and you'll have a much better response and maybe drug three will activate still another effector and you'll have adverse effect. And very recently, and this happened this summer, new compounds were published. So morphine actually binds to the receptor and this receptor activates two main effectors. We call them beta arrestin and GOGI. And we know that these two effectors are responsible for all these morphine effects, the pain-killing effect, but also the rewarding effect, and also the respiratory depression effect and the constipation. And Many studies, but I won't go into details, have demonstrated that actually this signaling effector may be the one responsible for the rewarding uh, effect and other side effects. So what a drug company has done in a, a few years ago is to try to screen compounds and find a compound that would bind to this receptor but specifically activate the red effector and would not touch or activate the blue effector. And if this would be true, then we would get analgesia and we would not get the other effects. And in fact, this drug is now in clinical trial phase three to kill pain with limited, hopefully, adverse effect. Now, much more recently, because we have, we know the crystal structure, the atomic structure of the receptor, we can now use what we call virtual screening, so it's much faster and much higher throughput to try and dock all kind of molecules virtually on the receptor structure and come up with molecules that are totally different from the morphine compounds in terms of structure and will specifically activate the red pathway and not the blue pathway. And there's a new molecule that has just been published this summer that may produce analgesia without producing euphoria. So we still need to do progress in there, but there's a way now to go and produce better analgesic. So that was one, one message here. Now let's focus, I told you there were three receptors, mu, delta, and kappa. Let's focus on mu receptors and reward processing. So we can still keep on using these animals that have no mu opioid receptor gene, so no mu receptors. And what we're going to see is that the if, well, rewarding, we say rewarding effect of morphines are to have totally disappeared, which in a way is expected. We took the target away. Morphine is not able to produce euphoria. I'm not going into details of the way we study this in animals, but basically the animal will tell us, well, the normal animal will normally tell you under morphine, I like the place where I get morphine, but this animal that has no more mu receptor doesn't care. You know, morphine or no morphine doesn't make any difference. It doesn't show a preference for morphine. But what is more interesting is that if we propose alcohol to these animals, they don't care. If we propose cannabis, they don't care. If you propose nicotine, they don't care. 
So in a way, a single receptor is actually critical to mediate the recreational properties of all these drugs. So we asked the question of, well, what about natural rewards? And as you know, natural rewards is a very important process in the brain. Uh, reward processing is absolutely necessary for the species survival and the individual survival. And three classical, traditional natural rewards are basically food, sexual activity, and social interactions. These are extremely important because, because these activities are rewarding, we're going to reproduce them and then we're going to be able to survive. And we were able to demonstrate that actually these little animals that are lacking the receptor that mediates drug reward also develop reduced maternal attachment. And to make a long story short, this tells you that social reward is extremely important in our development and if social reward doesn't function properly, then bonding doesn't function properly. And we were even able to show that the adult animals, these little pups became adult, develop autistic-like behaviors. So this mu opioid receptors is not only essential for artificial rewards, it is a receptor that is essential for natural reward processes. Now, we can do similar experiment with uh, animals that lack the delta or the kappa receptor. We can also use drugs that specifically activate or block these three receptors. And this is a summary of what all three receptors do in vivo. And it's a summary which summarizes both human and animal research. And basically, we now for sure now that mu receptor is the key for reward and will be important to initiate addictive behaviors. We also know that the kappa receptor is at the exact opposite and actually ligands, drugs that activate kappa receptor are highly dysphoric. It's just the yin and the yang in the hedonic tone. Now let's look at the delta receptor. It has been shown now since a few years that this receptor has a strong anxiolytic and antidepressant property. And this has led compounds into clinical trial now to treat depression. And what is interesting, if we look now at what we call emotional status or mood status, an active delta receptor is extremely good because it will improve mood. And at the other end again, we have the ugly kappa receptor whose activity created dysphoria and depressive-like behaviors. So in fact, we have three receptors that belong to the same neurotransmitter system, but because the receptor is located on different circuits in the brain, well, they fulfill very different functions. Now, let's go to addiction. Where do I put this receptor in the development of addiction? So this is a, a simple way a psychobiologists have conceptualized addiction. It's, it's a, well, an, an easy way to understand that addiction develops from recreational or social drug use uh, to compulsive drug use. And then uh, after binge, and then we enter a three-stage cycle where binge intoxication produces a positive subjective effect and then after the drug has cleared from the brain, we go into, the subject goes into a withdrawal, which is very aversive, a withdrawal stage. And when the withdraw after the withdrawal stage has developed, then uh, craving starts, and then preoccupation and searching for the drug, and then we go back to drug consumptions. And then the more uh, drug consumption, uh, the drug is consumed, the more we enter a stronger aversive phase, a stronger drug-seeking phase, and so on. So exiting this vicious circle is extremely difficult, and maintaining protracted abstinence, that is long-term abstinence, as you know, and we discuss about that, is extremely difficult and the real challenge in the clinic. So where do I put uh, or include opioid receptors in this scheme? Uh, well, the mu receptor is here, clearly is facilitating recreational drug use. Now, what about the two other receptors? Well, this is just to say that we have a lot of animal models to study these three stages of the vicious circle. 
there's fewer animal models that study the neurobiology of protracted abstinence. And this leads, leads me now to tell you a little bit about comorbidities and particularly comorbidity with depression. We're able to show that animals that are exposed to morphine, heavy doses of morphine, after a while, left alone in their cages for weeks and weeks, will develop what we call, I don't go into details here, a despair behavior and social deficits, social withdrawal. So we have modeled, in a way, protracted abstinence with those animals. And if we study these animals, we will see that serotonin, that is a main neurotransmitter for mood control, is totally disrupted. And we find that if we treat this animal with called Prozac, you know, the major antidepressant, well, we will reverse, or we will prevent the development of this social withdrawal. So, we also showed, uh, in summary, that the same thing happens if we expose the animal to heroin, that this is very long-lasting, it lasts weeks and weeks, which is month and month on a human scale, we were able to show that, in fact, the chronic stimulation of neuroreceptor in serotoninergic neurons is responsible for the mood deficit. We were able to show that mice that lack the delta receptor, remember, this is the antidepressant receptor, are actually much more vulnerable to this syndrome, and that mice that lack the kappa receptor, which is the receptor for dysphoria, are resistant to this uh, symptoms. So basically what I'd like to conclude here is that, well, if the mu receptor is important for recreational drug use, we clearly have an implication of kappa receptor in aversive effect linked to withdrawal, either short term or long term, and we may have an importance of the delta receptor activity to prevent this negative mood. And I'd just like to uh, finish this part in saying that comorbidity is important. You heard about this morning by uh, Nora the comorbidity between cannabis use and schizophrenia. Uh, in terms of opioid addiction, there's a, uh, alcohol addiction, there's a true comorbidity with depression. Uh, there's also a comorbidity between uh, um, schizophrenia and tobacco smoking. There's a comorbidity between opioid uh, addiction and PTSD. So I think it is important to consider that drug abuse can alter mood homeostasis, but also on the other hand, drug abuse can be considered in some cases as a self-medication uh, process. And we should never forget that brain health is, uh, or brain disease is broad and drug addiction interacts with other conditions of the brain. I'd also like to say that uh, I only told you about the mu opioid receptor as a target for reward, but each drug is different. So we talked about uh, cannabis, and you heard this morning that CB1, cannabis is activated another receptor. Uh, cocaine is activating a dopamine transporter, or inhibiting, by the way. Uh, nicotine is activating nicotinic receptors. Alcohol is activating all kind of targets. Al alcohol is a nightmare for a biologist because it has many, many targets in the brain. All in all, what I want to say is that each drug is actually affecting the reward system, but also has other activities, which are, for example, eating behaviors for the CB system, which has to do with motivation for the dopamine system, which has to do with arousal for cholinergic system. So it, we are touching in fact, drugs of abuse touch many, many brain circuits with many targets. So I want to give you an idea of the complexity. Now, just to finish, uh, I'd like to say uh, that we know, so we talk, what about the circuits? What happens in the brain to the brain circuits? I told you about this vicious circle. We have now a pretty good idea. So this scheme is from uh, George Coob and Nora, which shows you for, that each of these stage of the addiction cycle, different brain circuits come into play and are dysregulated. 
and maybe one way to understand what happens when we switch from a recreational drug use to the compulsive drug use is that when you uh, use the drug recreationally, the drug will produce a positive subjective effect, euphoria, then you will go through dysphoria, and then you go back to a homeostatic state, right? So as long as you're a recreational user, you'll get euphoria, dysphoria, and then back to normal. But when you switch to the addictive state, well, the dysphoria is getting bigger and bigger, and the euphoria is getting smaller and smaller. And then you, you go down to what is called an allostatic state so that your brain equilibrium has changed and your whole mood has changed. Uh, I, I'd like you simply to, to give you this notion of uh, basically adaptation in the neuron. If a drug is constantly, constantly inhibiting the neuron, well, the neuron will counteract this by pushing up system that will excite the neuron. So that when the drug is there, everything is steady state, but when the drug is off, the neuron excitability will burst out. This is withdrawal. And this happens at the level of the cell, and this happens at the level of the brain and the body. So that if an opioid is analgesic, well, a heroin addict under withdrawal will feel higher pain. You'll always get the opposite effect. So with time, and I made a kind of very simple cartoon to show you how adaptations in the brain spread out uh, throughout the brain. So as the brain is getting addicted, we find that reward processing, which I show here under, uh, well, I show you dopaminergic neurons, there's other brain areas that are involved, but basically these dopamine neurons will gradually evolve and adapt, and the reward processing is altered. Then this modification will spread to other areas like the extended amygdala, for example, which are responsible for the mood control and stress responses, and now this function will spread here and we'll see that the mood has lowered and that stress responses are enhanced. Then the adaptation will move next to what we call the motivation center, the nucleus accumbens, and no motivation of the individual will be entirely devoted to drug seeking rather than anything else in life. And further, this play, this brain area called the caudate pitamen, which is the area for habit forming, will be strengthened. So now the motivation will be hijacked towards the drug, habitual behaviors will be strengthened, and ultimately, and this is when people talk about will, you know, you have no will to quit the drug. Well, in fact, we know that cortical areas that are responsible for self-control have strongly weakened. So we know that there's many biological adaptations to the chronic drug exposure that will modify the brain durably. So um, I'll finish with this just saying that we know a lot about the biology. I just gave you a very small snapshot. But the treatment are extremely poor. There's very, very little treatment available, amazingly. Uh, basically treatment that are available today or what we call replacement therapy on target. So basically you're going to block the receptor that is actually the target for the drug. But this works, well, does not work so well. What works a little bit better is to block the receptor partially. This is what buprenorphine, on uh, what buprenorphine is doing or methadone. That is you're going to occupy the receptor well enough not to get withdrawal, but not sufficiently to produce the high. So this is a kind of way to maintain homeostasis in the chemicals, if you want, uh, or pharmacological homeostatic in the brain. And this is one of the strategy that is working pretty well to maintain, actually restore homeostasis. And there's also cross-target medication, like for example, blocking the mu opioid receptor, which is pretty much used to help uh, alcoholism. I will switch this, and I just want to stop with just four messages. First, we need to know that addiction is a brain disease. I know that among scientists, it's a kind of old story that we hear again and again since 20 years, but I know, I'm not sure this has reached the public well enough. 
the second point is, and we talked a lot about it, is prevention, rather prevent these damages to the brain, that try to cure them. That's, uh, to me, this is absolutely key. Uh, the third thing uh, is that we may also think about comorbidities uh, uh, of mental disorders, because drug abuse does not always come alone by itself. And finally, I think uh, the key, one of the key uh, response to treat is to restore brain homeostasis. And many approaches can be combined, and not only pharmacology, but psychosocial approach, and there's many, many approaches, and we heard about them uh, earlier. And one, I, I want to leave you with this. Thank you very much.